Our next guest is the 12th U.S. Secretary of Education. Please welcome Miguel Cardona to the South by Southwest studio. I am very excited to meet you. I have always, I, I, I watch news and politics like some people watch rock stars. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you are a rock star to me. So um, Thank you. Let's get into this. Uh, you were a keynote speaker last year during the virtual South right, by Southwest right. EDU. But this year, you are in person a year later. I mean, can you reflect on the online versus this year and how different it really feels? It's a different world. It's in, in, living, in, in person, in living color, it's great. Kind of like how our students felt when they went back to school. It's nice <laughs> to engage with people, socialize, smile, see beautiful smiles. Um, and, and that's what we're doing today. But the message is the same. We got to be student centered. We have to take advantage. Like a year ago, Friday, the American Rescue Plan came out. So we're celebrating a year of it being out there. And the message is now, make sure we're using these funds to help students. Let's level up education. Let's not go back to what it was. So the same level of urgency. We're talking about different topics, but it does feel good to be in person. I mean, you do your focus on social emotional uh, education. So what does this mean for you and, and how does this impact students? You know, I've been in education for over 20 years and social emotional support for students or access to mental health supports has always been like an ancillary when things really get bad. Yeah. I'm really excited about the opportunity now to make sure, as any educator across the country would tell you, our students need it earlier and they, all students need some support, right? All educators need some support. So I'm really excited about the disruption in education, providing us an opportunity to build it stronger than it ever was before, uh, making sure that mental health support are more part of not only the student experience, but the training for our educators. I, mean, I worked really closely with our, uh, you know, my school had a psychologist that kind of helped all the yeah. different kids and her work was so important and I felt it was on the same line as the math teacher. Nice. It really, really was. So studies have shown that kids can be anywhere from four months mm -hmm. to a year behind right now. Um, <laughs> do you think that we can bridge that learning gap? I mean, they've. If there's been such a, an equity right. in education. I do. I, I really do feel like we can, uh, but not with more of the same. Right. So the degree to which we're going to address the learning loss or the misinstruction depends on how bold we're willing to be, how innovative we're willing to be. And I can tell you there's never been a point in, in as long as any educator who's educating now, where there's been more money. Mm -hmm. in education in one year uh, with the American Rescue Plan. There's $130 billion. Uh, I know I'm, we're in Texas, $12 billion this last year uh, to really level up on those things that they need. Uh, additional teachers, smaller class size, after school programming, you know, wraparound services, the mental health supports. The, the funding is there. The urgency is there. We just got to get it done. I do think we can do it if we really focus on making sure we're using those funds to support students where they need it. So kids of color have been especially impacted, leaving them farther behind. Uh, what special efforts do we need to raise them up? Well, we need to, a culture that all children can achieve at high levels. Uh, you know, going back to March 2020 is not the goal. Mm -hmm. There were major gaps that kind of been normalized in this country uh, for decades. So one of the things we did at the Department of Education is we required every state to submit a plan that shows how they're going to address inequities and also how they're gonna engage stakeholders better, right? So these plans, some of them got pushed back because they weren't bold enough in terms of addressing inequities. So what we're doing is ensuring that there's a plan in place in every state to address inequities. And we're asking everyone to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable to making sure the students that were most impacted by the pandemic get more of the funds to maybe close those gaps um, as quickly as they were widened during the pandemic. So even though almost all schools are back open, many kids and their parents have chose to continue with remote learning. How important is it to get them back in the classrooms? And how are we gonna do that? You know, I always say it's easier to shut down schools than it is to reopen it. And we have to be respectful of the fear or anxiety that some families have. People experience this pandemic differently. Some, you know, lost loved ones. And there's still a lot of fear, a lot of trauma associated with that. So we need to be receptive. We need to be inclusive. We need to over communicate how our schools are safe and how it's good for the emotional well-being of students to be around peers, be with their teachers, not to mention the academic support that they can get being in person that's better than online. So it's an ongoing um, emphasis that schools have to have. It doesn't just mean just because you turn on the lights that everybody's going to come back. Let's work with our families. They need us, they need us now more than ever. Yeah, I read somewhere that, that 
when you make eye contact in person, something releases in your brain yeah. that actually creates more of a connection. So I'm really happy to see schools opening back yeah. up in person so the kids can have that, that feeling, that synergy. When I talk to students, including my own too, I have two high schoolers at home, they missed the social interactions. They missed the, the human connection. You know, at this age, this is such an important part of growing up is that, that human interaction, that emotional intelligence that they're building. You know, we rob them of that by having schools closed. Um, and while we had to keep them safe and it was important that we kept our schools closed when they were closed, it's really important that we get them together. But I also think schools need to consider ways to make up for some of that lost time by doubling down on the m amount of social engagement that students have, ensuring that every high school student has an opportunity to engage in a co-curricular, athletics, um, uh, you know, theater, or chess club, whatever. Yeah. Just let's get them connected more. I, I think that's a challenge that I'd love to put out there. Every high school student should be connected in a co-curricular activity. How cool would that be? I also think that keeps kids out of trouble, right. personally. Um, are schools offering enough in terms of myth mental health resources, resources for struggling students? Yeah, you know, I think we need to do more. I, I really do. I, uh, again, when I say let's not go back to how it was, yeah. one of the things that I mean is if we're providing the same level of social emotional support for those students who are struggling or the same level of mental health support access as we did in 2020, we're failing our kids. We're failing our kids. There's millions of dollars in our coffers. And I'm not saying it's easy because we have shortage in areas, yeah. but let's build relationships with hospitals where we could have the social work department at the hospitals engaging with families using ARP funds. Let's connect with the Boys and Girls Club, with the YMCAs to give kids a place to go after school paid for by the American Rescue Plan funds. There's so much more we can do. We can't go back to how it was before. Our kids need more now. And the funding is there and the will is there. So let's get it done. We got to be creative. Gotta I'm be from creative. Silicon Valley, so I, I believe in disruption. <laughs> exactly. So as Connecticut's education commissioner, during the onset of the pandemic, you were a strong advocate for keeping the schools open. Looking back, with hindsight being 2020, do you wish more schools stayed open? You know, it's always um, easy to analyze things after. I, I'll be honest with you, there was a point in July 2020 where I was, it was a tough, you know, we had a reopening plan. We didn't have a year's worth of uh, experience. I was trusting my colleagues, the epidemiologists and the health department, their analysis of how the uh, disease spread. And um, I was trying to make decisions based on what I felt was best for students, considering the impact of them not being in school as well. Um, but as I said before, you have very densely populated communities with a lot of black and brown folks who are suffering more mortality rates. If you remember, it was much worse uh, then. So we knew that we had to be transparent, open, and honest about what the risks were in all cases. And we put as much information out there, we gave as much resources, and we continued to support. And that's why Connecticut was one of the first states to reopen schools safely. And I have to put the word in safely, because other places did it kind of just haphazardly. And unfortunately, it ended up with more hospitalizations uh, of children and, and adults. But we did it safely, and um, I believe context matters. Uh, some districts had better resources, some had better, um, you know, lower rates in their community. So I thought it was done well. Obviously, at this point, 100% of our schools should be open. Uh, we know how to live uh, and thrive with a pandemic. We have vaccines, which mm -hmm. I want to encourage folks. If the numbers are low, there's a greater likelihood there will be disruptions. So we have vaccines, we have better therapies, we have better science, and uh, our kids need to be in the classroom. So what are some of the operational lessons that you learned in different waves of the pandemic? Well, you know, one of the things that I learned early on and it was reinforced throughout is that intentional collaboration matters, that we have to have people at the table discussing the problems and not think that we're going to get through this by having one or two people come up with a plan and having everybody co-sign on it. Mm -hmm. So this intentional collaboration matters. The increase in social uh, and mental health supports for students matters a lot. Any student you talk to, Yes, they're going to say it was harder to learn math, but they're going to say, I missed my friends. I missed. So making sure that we're intentional about giving students those opportunities. So from an operational standpoint, what are we doing to get kids together safely? Um, how are we making sure that our buildings have adequate staffing? So let's get creative there. One of the things that I, I saw in terms of that, because school closures were an issue when we couldn't, you know, we didn't have enough staff to, to cover. Uh, a couple states adopted a, a policy where they brought back retired teachers 
Oh. And he said, listen, it's safe for you to be here. We need you. You have experience. We're not going to uh, impact your uh, retirement benefits until June. You come back for this year and you get your retirement and you get the salary that you would get coming in as a substitute or incentivize it using federal American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, so they were able to keep schools open. Uh, and, and there were some creative ways. And our job is to really elevate those operational practices that work. I love that That's idea. It, yeah. That is a great it's a win -win, idea. Man. It's a win-win. I mean, if my kindergarten teacher could come back, I would absolutely go back to kindergarten. <laughs> All right, so the Biden administration has now forgiven more than $16 billion in student loans, more than any other administration, yet still a drop in the bucket. Um, if Congress fails to act, would the administration ever use executive action for more widespread debt forgiveness? Yeah, and that number's up to 17 and counting, right? Uh, but 17 billion in loan forgiveness already. Uh, yes, we're definitely continuing those conversations about how we can provide the most support for our students, especially during this pandemic. Uh, but we're not gonna stop our efforts to fix the system that got us to where we are, right? It's one thing to say, we're gonna provide loan forgiveness, but not fix the reason why we're in this hole right now. Mm -hmm. So we work to overhaul public service loan forgiveness, um, resulting in over 700,000 borrowers getting an email saying, hey, you're further along or you're done, which we're proud of. But there's still a lot of work to do. And those conversations are continuing with the Department of Justice, the White House, and the Department of Education. High priority for all of us. Hopefully a lot of those forgivenesses are for teachers. Yes, yes. So how do you see the alignment of learning to workforce development and preparing mm -hmm. students for jobs of the future? I'm really excited about this. I really am. I, we have so much, as a country, we can do so much more. I really feel like, you know, I, I say our high schools need to evolve quicker mm -hmm. uh, and engage with our workforce partners, engage with our two-year colleges or four-year colleges so that our students are, number one, excited about high school classes, electives where they have internships or they're learning about the regional workforce needs so that they could when graduating, have choices, right? Mm -hmm. I could go into the workforce and, and get a high-skilled, high-paying job, or I can go to two-year and, and advance my ability to uh, in, increase income, or I can go to a four-year school. Uh, I'm excited about the potential. Now that our schools are open, we really need to level up when it comes to providing career and college pathways for our students, not just in our technical high schools, in our comprehensive high schools as well. I'm really excited about that work. I, I I went to junior college because I didn't have the money to go to mm -hmm. school other than that at the time. Uh, do you encourage that as a, a through way? Because I don't know if I could have gone to a four year if I didn't start out in the two year and of course. saving money. Uh, and look at you now. And look at me now. I, awesome. I am a big proponent of the you community know, college uh, network. We have to do, you know, the, the president early on wanted to include universal access to community colleges because yeah, I mean the first lady would tell you yeah <laughs> it, it it's really the backbone of our our, our country's growth um, you know the community colleges are more malleable also to what the regional needs are the workforce needs are they can create programs more quickly to address the economic needs and I anticipate that community college are going to play such a big role in the infrastructure plan rollout where we need these high skilled high paying jobs the community colleges are going to work with us we're going to work with DOL. See, the, the, the short answer is yes. Yes. We have to do so much more to encourage uh, community college. I know in the most recent proposal, the president is pushing for a $2,000 increase in the Pell Grants, which means more students will have access uh, to those college. And not just your traditional 17 and 18-year-olds, but I bet a lot of adults who want to change where they're going after you know the pandemic, they said, you know, I had an epiphany. I want to change what I want to do, and I want to go back to school. So let's make them accessible. You know, these community colleges are great resources. You know, uh, San Francisco has made community college free, and I can tell you mm. that so many people I know of all ages are, are taking advantage of that, and it's actually really propelling it's, them to the next level. It's community development is what it is. Yeah. yeah. So large numbers of teachers, they're really burned out, yeah. and they're leaving the profession. I mean, how do we, how do we replace them, or how do we take care of them? You know, first and foremost, we need to respect our teachers. We need to respect the profession. I said in the beginning, I want to really elevate the profession. And, you know, what does that mean? That sounds nice, but what does that right. mean? Number one, we, we guard against these silly state laws that are undermining our profession and, and uh, making it seem like our educators don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so we got to honor the profession, respect the profession. We got to pay them a competitive salary, too. You know, the days of teachers working two to three jobs. Yes. Right? To make ends meet put their children through college, we, get, we have to do better. 
at the department, we're really looking into this, and we're going to spend some time focusing on that and lifting up, um, you know, competitive wages for educators. But it's more than wages. You know, when I talk to teachers, they say, not only is it wages, it's working conditions. I make sure that if you're asking me to address the trauma that students have, that I have an opportunity to learn about how to best support students. So professional development opportunities, time for teachers to invest in their professional growth as well, pipelines for teachers that want to be teacher leaders or administrators, making that a little bit easier and maybe making through lines for them for career growth. And then lastly, and I think this is really important post-pandemic, making sure that as we're thinking about how to reimagine schools, teachers have a seat at the table. Yes. You can't expect the ones who are closest to students not to be uh, have an important uh, voice in how we reimagine our schools. So give them a seat at the table. Make sure their working conditions are 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 good and, and, and can, they can grow, but also make sure that they have a competitive salary so that they feel valued in the community as well. I mean, I can't imagine being a teacher and coming back to a classroom that's been closed for a year and every single kid has some sort of trauma yeah. from being away and they do as well. And everybody, we're all in this together and we're all addressing it together, but that teacher is, they are on the front lines. They are the social workers, sometimes the policemen. They are the nurses. They are everything in one, and they're so important. Emotional first responders for 50 million students across the country. We need to honor them a little bit more. I agree. Yeah. So you are a former teacher, yeah. so you got some skin in the game here. What's your personal pitch to someone who's considering teaching? Now's the time. There's no better time in our country's history to get into the teaching profession, really. And I, and I speak with optimism and, and excitement because I do think our, the best days in education are ahead of us. This is the time, if you, if you wanna help your community, if you wanna help the next generation, this is the time to become an educator. My godson uh, is wrapping up his, his uh, education to become a teacher and I can tell the impact he's gonna have. These kids need more now than ever, someone to connect to, someone to look up to that cares for them. Um, the amount of influence you could have, not only on your students, but on families and on the school culture, is great now. So I encourage not only our youngsters who are thinking about a career in education, but our paraeducators, go get that degree. Those in the, in the fields where they feel like this pandemic taught me that I need to help my community, get into teaching. Um, it's a great profession. So um, just on a personal note, when you were striving to be a teacher, what was your inspiration? What put you in that direction? Yeah. You know, I come from a family of law enforcement, and I always wanted to serve the community. I saw how my father and my brother used law enforcement to serve the community, and I, I respected that. So I knew community service of some kind is going to be my calling, right? Mm -hmm. And then I had an art teacher who said, you know, Miguel, you should consider teaching because you, you use your art to communicate what your values are. And I said, oh, maybe I'll be an art teacher. So that brought me into uh, teaching, and then I gravitated toward elementary education, the rest is history. <laughs> what, did you feel like it was um, a calling of sorts? I wrote a piece once, um, you know, the profession needs to be an extension of who you are. Like, for me, um, service and, and, and children and helping children, you know, meet their needs and reach their potentials has really been a calling. It, it's an extension of who I am, really. So whether I'm a classroom teacher, principal, whatever roles I've had, it's about the students for me. and. I'm just blessed now that I have the ability to, my scope is the whole country. Um, I'm, I feel fortunate, I'm humbled to be in this position. But at the end of the day, those same values of me being a fourth grade teacher, wanting to help the 21 kids in front of me, that hasn't changed. And that's what drives me. And so my fifth grade teacher was the most patriotic man you could imagine. He had an American flag a tie that he wore every single day and he used to make us watch the news and I believe it was Iran Contra hearings were mm. happening but he had us engaging with what the country was about. He washed windows on weekends so that he could have this job because he knew how important his role was in raising wow. us to be you know, good people yeah. that are good for the country and good for the future. And Mr. Hansen to this day, one of my favorite teachers and it was because he was so, he was so inspired to do what he did that it translated and the kids exchanged that inspiration and they were into it. Like they were into everything that he had to tell because he was so passionate about history and, and how important it is to us that it, yeah. to this day, like I think Mr. Hansen, about Mr. Hansen, yeah. And it's good to call him out publicly, right? Cause he had that influence on you. Teachers have the ability to shape lives. You know, the content is important. And someone told me when I first started, I was a student teacher, I was like 21. Yeah. And um, Rindy Hardy in Berlin, Connecticut said to me, she goes, Miguel, 
you teach, you're going to be teaching kids, not curriculum. And that stuck with me. It's a, it, this is a relationship business. Yeah. It's about people. And um, they need more now. We've gone through trauma together. So the role of a teacher to influence children now is greater than ever. So yeah. incredible. I mean, you've talked about using the pandemic as an opportunity yeah. to reset and reimagine. What, what's your dream? What would you like to see happen, nuts and bolts and big dream? Sure. So, you know, I want to, what I'd like to see, and, and you know, go, very specifically, I want all high school kids to have access to a co-curricular activity. Yeah. I, I want our high schools to evolve to the point where we have students doing internships and getting out there to see what careers are available to them. Um, taking, uh, if they're really aggressive, graduate high school with an associate's degree. We could do that. Why not? Yeah. Let's make relationships with our, maybe have a community college in the high school um, where the students can have classes and maybe their parents could have classes in the afternoon too. Um, I want to make sure that our kids are reading by third grade. It sounds so basic, but yeah, if but we don't do that, it's going to be intervening after. I want to make sure that the experience that our children have is just as much developing their, um, you know, their, their mental health uh, and, and emotional needs as it is academics. Because if you're, if you're thinking about something or if you're bothered by something or if you're, you're down, your bandwidth for learning is going to be diminished. Yeah. Um, so I want to make sure that our schools are community schools where parents feel comfortable coming in and being a part of the conversation and uh, having their, their voices heard in the conversation. I want to make sure that students by middle school are thinking about, you know, what college do I want to go to? And, and remove those barriers that exist currently today mm -hmm. where many families by middle school or high school say I can't afford college so don't think about it to their children yeah you know we have to make it more accessible we have to make it more affordable in the higher ed space but I also want to see uh, better connections between our pre-k 12 and uh, higher ed there's a lot I want to do there's so there's much there's a lot I want to do and you know what we're gonna get it done I'm confident we're gonna get it done Right now, what we need to focus on is making sure that the American Rescue Plan funds are going to address the inequities that were made worse during the pandemic and that we're bold and innovative around how to improve education. I mean, as I said before, we hit reset. Pandemic shut us down. As we reopen, let's not go back to what it was. Rebuild better. Exactly. Build back better. <laughs> so I have a uh, personal question I need to ask you, um, and this is the most important question that you are going to answer today. Is the science fair coming back to the White House? Oh. I hosted it with Bill Nye during the Obama administration, and it is one of my most favorite memories. The kids, I tell stories about them to this day, and I'm just letting you know, when right. the White House science fair comes back, I'm available that day, whatever we're, day it is. We're on it. We'll let you know. We need you there. <laughs> you know, and, and absolutely, right? So that's something that people remember, too. Yes. But the, the computer science roles and the, the science, like, we really need to elevate that, too. The, the jobs that are out there, the careers in science are exploding. So uh, starting with the science fair back at the White House, I think yes. that's a great way to kick it off. So my, my folks will talk to your folks, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't tell them I was going to ask you that, you know. Hey, it's all gotcha. good. We got it in. We got it in. No, I love it. I love it. I'll get your card. All yeah, right. Good, <laughs> Thank good. you for stopping good. by. It is really amazing that you took this time to come talk to us in the studio. Is I'm a big fan. Thank so. You. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure. Thanks for what you're doing. There is more to come from the studio, so stay tuned. You can see the complete interview schedule at southbysouthwestedu.com slash studio. And you can find all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest EDU TV app, available on Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, and Amazon Fire. See you later.